has some bacteria that she's handing out. So. This is the area I guess. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, I'll uh, introduce um, just briefly introduce Hans Rinkies here in that side of the room, um, from the Department of Forestry, who is here to talk about the uh, aphids that have been affecting our spruce trees. That is obviously very near and dear to many of your hearts. We've had a lot of calls, probably the most popular program we've ever put on at Coastal Studies. <laughs> um, and we know that it's we know that it's very popular. Hans said that he would be willing also to sort of do uh, do it in two stages. So those of you that like can't quite hear in the back and whatever, um, you know, you can come back in later once the front moves out and we can um, answer questions and whatnot. But um, we're also recording uh, his presentation and the questions, and we have copies of uh, his PF, uh, PDF um, handout. So if you've given us your email there, then we will we will send a handout. We'll be posting a link to um, the recording of the presentation put on a YouTube channel and post it so you can watch it or share it with people. So I'm sure um, that there'll be a lot of questions and he'll be giving us a lot of really good information. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm just going to let you go. And um, Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Can everyone hear me back? In the front, anybody going deaf in the front? Yeah. Are we screaming? A little louder, please. Yeah, loud. OK, how's this? Is that good? OK. Uh, my name is Hans Frankie. I work for the Division of Forestry, State of Alaska, in uh, Soldotna here. We cover the Kenai Peninsula and the Kodiak Chain of Islands for uh, forest management and wildland fire suppression. And I appreciate everyone's, as a forester, I'm always excited when people are interested in the forest. So I I'm, I'm, uh, appreciate everyone being here tonight. Uh, I'm sure there's you know, some individuals in the room who are much more of an expert on spruce aphid than I am, or aphids in general. And uh, so kind of what I'll do is run through about half a dozen, six or eight slides, PowerPoint, and then we'll have question and answers after that. That's kind of usually how these things work best. So hopefully at the end of this, you can have some idea of uh, spruce aphid life cycle, biology, um, kind of impacts to local, to the to trees that we can expect, and then some projection of, uh, you know, long-term health of uh, the sick of spruce here in uh, kind of home or proper. So, um, as you can see here, this is a picture of a uh, sick of spruce right here with uh, little aphids on it. Right here, you can see these tiny little guys on there. Uh, not an uncommon sight, certainly around town here. And this is kind of what do we know about sp uh, spruce aphids. So spruce aphids have been around in the United States since the mid to late 1800s, I think the 1880s, um, originally from Europe. Uh, oh, way wrong. Sorry, 1910 in Vancouver, British Columbia. So uh, it's been established in southeast Alaska for like the last uh, 20 or 30 years for quite some time. And it's been, you know, recently seen here in uh, south central Alaska just in uh, 2015 or so. So uh, it impacts Sitka spruce, blue spruce, Norway spruce. Those are kind of the, the species we might find here in Alaska, obviously, blue spruce and Norway spruce would be plant as ornamentals. Um, in other parts of the U.S., it'll uh, impact uh, Engelman spruce and the uh, higher elevations of the northern Rockies and central Rockies. A key indicator, which is kind of what you see around town here, is you see, uh, you see spruce trees that are, are red needled and they have green tips on there. And uh, the spruce aphids prefer needles that are at least one year of age. So spruce trees, the needles on, a, on any conifer are leaves. And, and those trees, those leaves are oldest on the, the interior of the tree. And you know, you from living here, you notice that every year you do see a few brown needles under spruce trees that actually fall off. And that's that tree, you know, losing those leaves every, uh, you know, four or five years. We get a flood of calls for, for uh, you know, pretty common in the Kenai here for ornamental plantings of lodgepole in the fall. People that think they're dying and they're just losing their needles. Those turn red as well, kind of from the inside yeah, out. Here. So, uh, mm -hmm. how's this better? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And anybody in the front? We'll be out here. Uh, we're fine. Okay. 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 You guys won't be able to hear when you leave. Um, so, they like the older needles 
which on the interior of the tree, the new growth of the tree is not tolerable to them. Uh, it's believed to be that's because of a, uh, the higher nitrogen content in that those green tips of the needles. So uh, not palatable to them. That's why you see those those green needles still in the tree. So um, the mobilized nitrogen in that new growth is uh, hard for them to digest, and it's not preferred by the aphids. Well, the, the life cycle, the biology of spruce aphid is. Uh, they reproduce parthenogenically, so without mating, and they give live birth to, uh, to, to nymphs. Um, so they can't have winged and wingless versions. Most of them documented in the U.S. for the spruce aphid are not winged versions. It's a pretty complex life cycle. I spent a lot of time, obviously, uh, the last you know four or five months talking to entomologists, and they just tell me it's complex. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, two emerging circles, you know, as a forester, obviously, I've got quite a bit of entomological training, but uh, it's still, I just left it at that. There, there are like, you know, gardeners in here, you'll know there's like 400 kinds of aphids in the, I think maybe, I don't know if that's in the U.S. or in the world, but uh, um, there's a lot of aphids out there. You know, another common aphid we see here is the birch aphid. You see that, right? Uh, pretty common aphid here to see on the Kenai Peninsula. So the majority of them you see are, are uh, wingless females, and they, they obviously feed on the sap, right, or the sugar of those needles. And there's been some um, literature that they believe <clears throat> actually trees that are... Uh, Showing, showing signs of stress, you know, trees that are starting to yellow are actually uh, a favored food or the nymphs have a higher uh, success rate or they grow larger on trees that are stressed. So pretty common with any insect population, uh, spruce beetle will be the same, right? So once those insects get into that tree, uh, they start to stress that tree um, and that tree becomes more favorable to them so they will attract more insects or reproduce more insects to uh, This is kind of the time period we're in right here. Uh, Midsummer now is where we have, so the, the population is such that it, um, the, most of the feeding occurs in what we would consider late winter or early spring. So February, March, <coughs> April here. That's the red trees you see now were fed on in, in February and March <coughs> and April. And those populations build up very quickly. Those, uh, those nymphs can mature and have their own young within like five to seven days. So those populations grow very dramatically. Um, you know, they uh, are using their sucking mouth parts to eat the, the sap, the needles of the tree. And then as the, po as the summer continues, that population declines. So right now we're kind of in this wane of the population, um, entering into you know, mid to late summer and into fall. Why does it decline? Um, that's a good question, I don't know. It's complex. Oh, it's complex. <laughs> I mean, part, complex. Of, part of it would be food source, right, I'm sure, yeah. right? So they're kind of eating, they've kind of, you know, um, the, tr you know the trees that they've been feeding on are declining in health, right? Uh -huh. So there's not the available food source, and they don't prefer the new green shoots, which kind of, you know, come out here middle of June or solstice. And so, uh, you know, I guess it's some sort of combination of that, How about essentially. Heat? How about heat? Um, Heat is actually encouraging to the to them. Cooler, rainier weather can discourage reproduction of the of the overall of the spruce aphid. Um, and you know the as far as the biology goes, the reason that we're in this room tonight is uh, you know basically a series of warm winters. So those those more of those spruce aphids can overwinter. The few that do, they grow in these populations. A few warm winters in a row, and uh, outbreaks like this are possible. So, you know, with a, with a cold, I'm, I'm just saying a normal winter, you know, I've heard different numbers on temperature, but with a normal winter, well, we should see a drastic reduction in, in you know, the aphid population, <coughs> in, you know, kind of home or proper here, pelvic toe. <coughs> so these, Little dots here from aerial surveys that are that are done every year for uh, insect and disease, forest insect and disease across the state of Alaska. <laughs> Obviously, not all of Alaska is flown every year, but you can just kind of look at this. So, just for folks in the back of the room, the bottom, the yellow here is 1997, the green is 2004, this kind of burnt orange is 2005, 
this, what is that? This kind of, uh, teal. Teal. thank you very much. Teal. A lovely teal, 2007, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a moss green, is uh, 2015. So when I look at this, I think I can, you can pretty clearly see that it's, it is weather driven, right? You might see it for a few years in one location and then it disappears, more or less. And that's just that little series of, uh, you know, winters, like, you know, for instance, this would be Seward right here, you can see in 07, uh, what they thought to be spruce safe there. So how the aerial survey works is just as it sounds, flying around, mapping. Um, and then what I'm trying to get at here is uh, this is a good indicator, but not 100% accurate. And then the idea is that uh, some of those spots are gone back to a ground check to make sure it is actually spruce safe food or uh, not something else. So, a question. Yeah. What's happened to the spruce population in the areas that were from 97, 2004, 05 that are in the southeast? Okay. So the question is, uh, what happened to the spruce in the southeast? Um, from everything I've heard, the spruce are still there. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> so kind of the, the the life cycle of the the aphid, like we talked about, is that it doesn't prefer that new growth. And the combination of that along with having that kind of seasonal or climatic factor for the, for the population um, hasn't led to outright mortality, you know, standard wide. So in southeast Alaska, the, the caveat to all this is this is kind of the first, right, you know, seen on, in south central Alaska. Um, but in southeast, they haven't seen outright mortality of the spruce. They've seen just decline growth, right? So that, that green growth on the ends, you know, of the terminals keeps those trees living. Um, the red needles will fall off, and you might have uh, slow growth for quite a while, or quite some years, until those needles, kind of, uh, new years of needles grow out on those branches. So the new needles will grow in branches that have been eaten? Yeah, you bet. You'll see that around town right here when you leave. You can look out the back right there right now, and you can see some uh, red trees that have green little tips on the ends. Um, actually, there's one right in the parking lot right there. Well, I understand that, but closer to the trunk of the tree. No, no they're dead. If they're red, they're dead. But no. will they grow back? No. 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 So, yeah, so they, they, won't, they won't fill back in in, that, in the interior of that tree. Will not. No, yeah, correct, yeah. So, but you'll get growth on the on the outsides of those branches still, yeah. Sorry, yep. If they're wingless, how do they transfer from tree to tree to neighbor um, to neighbor? They can't have winged versions, but they don't have very many of them. It's just uh, popu just, just the numbers, just the number of populations. So they get such a high population that they're either transferred, you know, they're vectored by moving something, or they're vectored by crawling around over there, or maybe a couple of them have a winged version and fly over there. So it's just a, uh, the population gets so high that they're, that kind of makes sense. Fall for one tree. So the branches that have the green on the end, yes. and they're dead in the middle, is, it, is that branch still strong enough as it gets greener on the end to support it, or will that get heavy and break them? Um, <coughs> I want to anticipate much breakage. I don't, I don't think, you know. And then the branch itself is still healthy. The branch is still yeah, the branch, alive. Yeah, the, yeah, the tree, is, tree is still alive, yeah. Correct. So I don't we've, want to... We've got a bunch of uh, trees that are close together. Sure. And when we have <coughs> big wind, yeah. we notice that it spread really quickly. Okay, so I sure. think when the trees are close, I think the wind can sure. punch them over. Mm -hmm. You bet. Not unforeseen with the high population, right? You have thousands and thousands of them. So that with most, with pretty much any, you know, any forest path up, you know, uh, fungus or insect, we have quite a bit of information you know, throughout history. Spruce bark beetle, right, the most common right. for Homer here. You know, a lot, decades of, uh, of, of uh, proven science on spruce bark beetle. And, you know, we just, we, we have that for, certainly in Europe they have that, certainly in Southeast we have a good idea. We don't really have any idea here. But we do know that, uh, you know, we're a little farther north, right? So climate should should hopefully you know curtail this at some point. Um, but uh, you know that's why I don't have a lot of kind of a hard answer if that makes sense for uh, kind of what what uh, the trajectory of where this will go. So, so we don't have a hard winter this winter to knock their numbers back. Say. Yeah. So these green 
green tips will be a year old next year. And so they're going to eat those green tips. And then more yeah. green tips grow. Yeah. So this is just going to keep going until... Until a cold winter. Until a cold winter. <laughs> well, in a year they won't. Yeah, it'll... Uh, so, exactly right. Next, next year we'll all be a year older. <laughs> including the tips on the branches. Um, and so... There's a couple control measures I'll get to. You know, I'll get to that you can you can use to uh, pesticides that are available. Um, and I'll uh, I'll kind of uh, oh, we can talk about those right now. So there's basically two pesticides. Some individuals in this room maybe have experience with using those. Um, there's actually several kind of pesticides. There's two treatment methods. One involves um, soil drenching, which is pesticides at the roots of your tree, which uptake that <coughs> pesticide in your tree and uh, kill the aphids. And the other is an injection into your tree, which is uh, you know taken out by the xylem of the tree and will uh, kill the kill the aphids in your tree. So, um, just like you're commenting, every year they're going to be getting older, but every year also you're going to be putting on growth, right? So. You know, persistent years. If this have, if we have, if we don't have any reprieve, or, you know, if we need to break our skis out for another three or four years, that that could potentially certainly stress those trees enough that they just die. You know, that's not unforeseeable, um, because you have to imagine they're going to be putting on less growth every year, right? They're stressed, and so you know, additionally, there's certainly trees around town that you see here that just I look outright dead. You know, so when I say when I say no widespread mortality, that doesn't mean no mortality. That means, you know, if it follows what, what's been seen in southeast, you know, probably 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the trees may die as a result of this. The caveat to all that is it's hard to tell. Trees may trees are obviously weakened by this, so maybe another impact to the tree that's actually killing it, you know, it gets a little difficult to tell at kind of certain stages, but uh, there's certainly <coughs> Reducing the growth and the vigor of the trees. Has there been any interrelationship between this and the spruce bark beetle coming back? In other words, this stressing trees, therefore making them more susceptible to the spruce bark beetle. Sure. Another insect. Yeah, we we haven't seen that now. I mean, the active spruce beetle on the Kenai Peninsula is in the North Kenai and the Kiski particularly. Um, it's not unforeseeable, you know. Spruce bark beetle is a natural forest insect, and, and so to see some of that around would be unforeseeable. Um, I guess it remains to be seen, right? You know, I mean, it, it, it really has to, I, th I think as a forester, I'd say it has to do with duration. You know, if this sticks around for a while, um, maybe. I'm kind of jumping ahead here to a few of my slides, but where this has been, um, I'll, I'll kind of answer the second part of that question in a second. How's that sound? So this is, uh, most folks are familiar with this. This is Talbot Cove. Um, and you know, you can see, actually this is a good example, right? You can see spruce beetle trees, old spruce beetle remnants, and spruce aphid. Obviously a lot of public interest. Here's the mm -hmm. news media. And so this kind of gets to your question, you know, what, uh, you know, what are, what are uh, agencies involved with natural resources doing? And, you know, right now we're in obvious, we're in a uh, assessment phase, seeing where where the spruce aphid is, right? And you know, we've got some monitoring spots. The um, U.S. Forest Service does their state and private forestry office with their uh, entomolog entomology staff. And everyone here is probably pretty <coughs> aware. You know, we've seen it in Halibut Cove. Now you see it on parts of Yukon Island now, Sadie Cove, and then. Here in, in town, you know, we've seen it kind of crawl up to 12, 1400 feet up here on Diamond Ridge and then out six or seven miles out East End Road. And um, I guess my thought is, you know, you're, you're along with the spruce beetle, you know, one, if we get a return to a normal winter, the footprint of this will be fairly small. And two, as folks that live here know, the farther you get out of town, you climb an elevation and you get it gets colder, right? So I think there's kind of two things working there that might help and keep it contained to, you know, home or proper, if you will. So, does that answer your question, kind of spruce beetle-ish? Um, I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. We can kind of go into question and answers now. This is my, that was my last slide. We kind of did a, where was it? Go ahead. Let me turn the light on. You're 
you're describing this as a coastal issue, but is there any you know, collaboration with Canada on the interior and further, further south? Um, British Columbia has done a lot of research. There's a lot of research out of British Columbia with the Sitka spruce they have there. But it, as far as I've been told, and as far as what the literature says, is white spruce hasn't been a, a, a susceptible host for spruce aphid. So, you know, as far as, um, you know, the U.S. Forest Service or the state reaching out to any of the Canadian provinces, I, I'm not aware of that. Is, oh, is there any evidence of the trees building immunity either for themselves or for their offspring? Ah, very good question. Um, from the reading I've done, the literature, there, there is. And, you know, I think from roaming around, you kind of see that around here. You see some trees that are not impacted at all, but perfectly green. Um, and others that don't, and, and uh, you know, I guess we'll see how long that lasts. But there is some, that's not uncommon for trees. Some, you know, with spruce beetle, you, you see the same thing with certain mistletoes and pathogens. You see the same thing with certain trees have certain higher resistance to insect and or diseases than others. Is it just kind of easier for them to go to the plants that are already started dying or started being effective rather than for the healthier trees? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know that we know the reason why some trees are more less susceptible to, you know, than others, whether it's like pheromones the trees are giving off that are not as attractive, or it's, uh, but yeah, it's not. It's, like, it's kind of a big question. Go ahead there in the back. Okay, um, so you, you touched on pesticides. Sure. So what else does that affect besides the spruce aphid? Um, you know, like the birds that eat the the whole cycle? Yeah. Does it get ugly? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, here, here's what I, I can tell you. That both those techniques that are, that are being used, you know, soil drenching and injection, they're techniques, it's, some of them are actually the same pesticides that are used for, in the lower 48, controlling emerald ash borer, which is, you know, a, a very large, uh, it, uh, leads to a lot of mortality for hardwood trees in the lower 48. So they're, they're pretty widely used in other places in the U.S. Uh, probably not so much in Alaska here because, um, you know, this aphid is relatively, to, uh, relatively new to, to some parts of Alaska. But uh, similar techniques were used in Sitka, you know, southeast Alaska, and found to be effective in, um, you know, slowing the spread or allowing trees a little reprieve, a little, a little uh, growing space there. So, do they have any natural predators? You bet, they do. Um, tip, your typical, net, you know, typical natural predator for any aphid, you know, lady, uh, ladybugs, right? You know, um, woodpeckers, clared beetles, woodpeckers. Yeah, you, there, there's, you know, any probably hundreds of uh, insect and or animals that would feed on aphids. Any, any aphid. I wish I could get some in my greenhouse because I have some aphids in there right now. <laughs> Go ahead. What is the sticky stuff that's associated with them? Ah, that's uh, you see that right on the needles, the black. There's some mm -hmm. black sticky, sticky mm -hmm. stuff, and that's just that. Uh, and you sometimes you see ants, right? And that's just that that sap, you know, from the tree essentially, right? So that feeding from they have these sucking mouth parts, and that's just residual um, sap. Sometimes they have a sticky saliva they'll put into the needle to facilitate getting out of the sap, and so. That sometimes with the populations, you know, leads to that. You'll see it on right on your car or on. You so know, it's backwash. Aphid backwash. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty good sign to have aphids. You know, yeah. Yeah. Street, right? if your car is covered in. Go ahead there. Will, will the birds be killed by using these pesticides? Um, but I can just say that they're they're. Uh, The soil, I know for certain that the soil drenching pesticide, it's um, trade name is Monterey, and it's it's uh, it's not a restricted pesticide. It's available. You can buy it down here at the wagon wheel. It's not restricted, so it doesn't take a uh, certified applicator to to apply it in a commercial setting. The uh, the injector injections, I I'm unsure if those are uh, restricted or not. I, I think they may be restricted, so only a uh, certified applicator would be able to apply those in a commercial setting. So, do you know what that chemical is called? Uh, the trade name of that is Point. I've got the, the uh, 
product labels for both of those, pretty much we'll look afterwards. How does that sound? Uh, you never accept just one thing. Yeah, I, I, I can't answer that question. I guess I can just say that uh, one, you know, one's not restricted, so it's available for public use. Um, one's for you know professional or uh, certified applicator. So you would ask. Him. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the local arborist is saying that it won't affect the bird population. Now, you yeah. know, that's his opinion. You bet. He's the one doing yeah. the injecting. Correct, yeah. Can you repeat Can that? You, yeah. He said the local arborist. What's, what's his name? His name is um, uh, Curtis. Curtis. Curtis, yeah. Okay. Curtis is saying that it it's such a low dose that's uh, a targeted for such a tiny little insect that it's not going to affect the bird population. Sure. I talked with him at quite length about yeah. it. And felt confident, but not 100 percent. I mean, there are a couple non-pesticide-related control measures you do, which are, are you know not very realistic for most of the Sitka spruce and Homer here. One of them is uh, same as you'd use in your garden, your greenhouse, and that's just hosing off the tree, right, blowing those aphids mm -hmm. off there. Which you know, if you have landscape-sized trees in your yard, you know, you could you could attempt to do that. Um, you know, most of these trees aren't, aren't that size, but that would be something we could give or we could try. We tried that. We, we got a pressure washer. Sure. And um, it just really beat up the trees. Sure. That's what Curtis said. Curtis said he could damage the trees. Sure. Yeah. yeah. There's no perfect answer. As an aside, I've seen a trem tremendous number of ladybugs. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there are, I counted five just standing there. I could count five on the All right. But uh, my question was the fire behavior in these trees. Fire behavior? Yeah. I guess in, in there's a. Uh, I'll break that. I'll kind of break that into two parts. How does that sound? You know, the, the kind of the, the, the advice, you know, I would give is if you have a tree with aphids is. There's, there's no rush to remove that tree, you know, un until you can see if that tree recovers or not, right? This winter may be a colder winter, the population may go down. This winter may not be a colder winter, you may have a tree that has more resistance, you know, and your tree may certainly survive, which is what we, which is what's happened in the southeast. Um, you know, red needles certainly have a bit higher of a volatility, certainly, than green needles do. You know, not much in reality because, uh, those green needles have terpenes, which is oils, and those red needles have less of those terpenes. So I, I guess I would generally answer that question that there's you know probably no rush to remove them from a fire sense other than you would for a, you know a traditional firewise setting. You know if you have one of these trees adjacent to your home or a building that would pose a, a hazard when it's green and now it's red, it may be an opportunity for you to remove it. You know if there's maybe if it, if it's appearing to like it may be on the fringe of not making it anyway. So that answer your kind of your question is kind of a Yeah, I was just uh, wondering about you know fire spread and wildland fire yeah. threat associated sure. with this. You bet. So I mean kind of the way the way the timber is here at Homer, especially post spruce beetle, is you know we kind of have islands, right, of, of uh, Sitka spruce more or less here. And so, you know, what's what's a little more common you see with red needle deal, whether it's uh, for any reason timber is you see uh, it will certainly be a little more volatile, and it will be prone to spotting a little more, right? If those, if, if a group of those trees, you know, ignites, they may, you know, send some embers, where uh, green trees aren't quite as prone to do that. But, you know, I think overall, with uh, relatively small size in the footprint here of the aphids, um, and you know, not being a continuous forest, I'm not anticipating any major increase in fire hazard. Is there any data on how cold it has to be to kill them all? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so no. oh, uh, <laughs> some of the stuff I've read says about uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what the duration for that is. You know, obviously that's not unforeseeable here. Probably we've seen it the last few winters here. Um, you know, I think of just. Uh, I don't have any hard numbers for for your answer for that, and I can work on doing that and get back to you on that. But I, I think what what the general consensus is is just a shift kind of to 
you know, normally. Maybe a 2012 winter, right? Or a 2013 winter. 2012. 2013 was awful. So, go ahead. So, uh, I've heard of, with the uh, birch, they could have uh, uh, mixing, uh, like, uh, Blue Dawn or something with, okay, with, yeah. with, with, uh, with the hose, with a little spray can. Sure. Does that is that old wives' tale or is it does a little detergent do any, make any difference? And there was some other something else, some some uh, other uh, something that someone was putting with it. it was, Ammonia? No, it was you know some organic thing. Or I, 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 I believe that's true. I, I believe you can reduce the population of aphids. I, I've heard of that more for like uh, ornamental setting, you know, or, yeah, or garden setting. Yeah, we have setting. some smaller, you know, sure. younger ones that yeah. are being affected and accessible. What you're uh, talking about is that neem oil. Yeah. Can you mix it yeah. with yeah. a little bit of uh, gone you back yeah. 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 That, that I thought neem oil was more for preventive. And, but once an infestation gets started, it's, it gets overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. it, it, is rec it, it is a recommendation as well for, for uh, keeping populations low, right? It can be used to do that. The, the tough thing um, with the neem oil or the insecticidal soaps is uh, insects go through different, it's different development phases called instars, right? So they kind of, as they're growing, different instars. And so you, you have to hit the nymphs at just the right instar to, to yeah, that was that was my other question. Is, is what's the time frame that you're talking you about? Spraying um, the soap. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I if you, if you were to try that, I would say you should be doing that in like late winter or early spring when that when they're when they're feeding on your needles of, of your trees, and you can inspect them and see that. You, know, you can look at them. And, and how long are they active? Um, that you would, that's a tough, they're, I would guess they're active from what kind of we saw this last year. You know, they're probably they're active in starting in February and going through April in that feeding phase. So that's probably pretty dependent on your location, you know, the temperature of your location and, and what they're doing. But that's when those populations are building and they're, they're feeding. <coughs> Thanks for being here for us. But if you had a couple real nice trees in your yard, you bet. <laughs> what would you be doing early in the season, yeah. mid-season, and now? Sure. Um, what I'd be doing, uh, I'll just start right now, is that so? What I would be doing now is I'd be injecting my trees. Uh, with pesticides. If I wanted to, assuming, assuming I want to keep my trees green, is that what you're saying? All right. I would, Whatever uh, you want to do yeah, okay, with your yeah, trees. I would, uh, I, would, I, would inject, I would inject them with pesticide. Uh, to, to, to keep them green, and then I would, uh, so what that's going to do is next spring, when that feeding starts, that pesticide will be in the tree, you know, it has about a 12 month duration in the tree, it'll be in the tree, and then I would be watering my trees with some uh, regularity to, you know, we've had warm winters, we've also had dry summers, and uh, I'd be watering them to provide some supplemental watering, so, um, you know, just to keep that tree vigorous, and also that would also, uh, aid in the transportation of that pesticide, you know, through the flow them to different portions of that tree. So is that surface watering or root feeding? Um, I would just put my hose by the base of the tree. <laughs> you know. They're not very deep. Yeah, so the best way to think of a, of a spruce tree especially is uh, like a wine glass on a dinner plate, right? So those are the roots kind of a deal. Shallow rooted, they go up quite they go out, it used to be kind of thought it was the same on top as it is on the bottom, but uh, you know, they go out quite a ways, mm -hmm. uh, not very deeply. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then in the springtime, I would just be inspecting my trees, you know, out in the late winter, early spring, I'd be out there, and you know, you, today, just, you know, poking around, I found some nymphs on some, some of the green branches, you know, you can still see the tiny little, but in the spring, you, people in here, I'm sure, you can just see the aphids pretty clearly right there out there, so. I would be inspecting them and, uh, you know, seeing what was going on with the tree there. What do you do in the spring? I uh, tried soap and it wound up with a red tree. Yeah. Well, in the spring, you know, I'd hope that pesticide would be working, right, and, and killing us. It, it doesn't work immediately. Well, if I if, if you inject them now, you would have coverage for those for that next spring feeding. Yeah, um, this year's over. And that's what I would hope. Yeah, so tree, needles are red now. 
we'll, we'll, we'll any preventative measures we're talking about now, we'll be out. We'll be talking about for that'll be for next late winter, early spring. So then I'll just be looking at them and seeing, you know, seeing if I could find uh, uh, aphids on there. And if I was finding aphids on there, you know, then there's not much you can do. So when you've already injected them, so I'd maybe try housing some off. I'd maybe try. It all depends on the size and shape of your tree. Go ahead. Can you say injecting? Is that something we can do? Or is that the drenching of the soil? Or is that no, the, 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 uh, the injecting and the drenching are, are two different techniques. One that, and they're just like they sound. One is actually injecting a pesticide into the tree. And one is taking pesticide and you know, adding water and pouring it around the base of your tree. And that, the, both of those um, rely on tree physiology translocation, right, to be pulled up into the tree and then distributed to the to the needles of the tree where those uh, aphids will be feeding. So, um, conifers are pretty basic trees. They don't transpire a whole lot compared to, you know, a, a birch or a, or a cottonwood. Cottonwoods are notorious for pulling a lot of water. But, you know, I would, I would think it would probably be a few weeks before you get into that movement uh, from the soil drenching. And you know, from stuff from what I've read and from, from talking to some folks, you know, the injection seems to be maybe you know half of that, a week to ten days before that gets in the, you know, translocated throughout the tree. So, so that's something that we, we as individuals can do, or we have to hire somebody. It has to be a certain person. Well, it's thirty-five dollars a tree for the injection technique. Mm -hmm. So if you're just protecting a couple around your house, it's actually fairly reasonable. And oh, you want to do it when the sap is running. So he had to wait until the soil warmed up and the sap was running. So you, he waited and waited until early May. So you can't really do it in March or when the tree is dormant. So, so summer, so when fall comes and the sap isn't running anymore, that pesticide is just sit there and do nothing. So, it's really now So you say you keep saying that the aphids are feeding in the spring. What are they doing now? What's their life cycle? And what are they doing? Do they just die in the winter? They can't die out. The yeah, they they don't die off. The population severely declines here. So right now, where are we at? Oh. Right now we're here, seasonal collapse, midsummer. So right now the aphid population is it's built up in the spring and been feeding, and then you know because of uh, red needles, right, lack of lack of uh, suitable hosts, and the way their life cycle works is that life cycle tapers off. Now in the spring, you know, or excuse me, in the midsummer, you can still find a few, like I said, you, could, you know, you can find a few nymphs or maybe a few aphids, but you're not going to find very many um, compared to what you may have found in April or May on the trees. So they'll overwinter, those females will overwinter, just, you know, does not take very many, mm -hmm. obviously. Remember, it's a very complex life cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and then those populations grow dramatically in the springtime, you know, every five to seven days, the, the new female can have more young, and so it grows exponentially, and then drops off, kind of cyclical. So we're seeing aphids on other trees, like our elderberries, our choke cherries, our they the same aphids or different aphids or? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Back to your 400 types of aphids. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. They, it, it could be either one, you know. Um, are, the, are they affecting the health, do you think, of those plants or? Not to a large degree, yeah. I don't think. Then, I would, then they could be potentially spruce aphids. It would, same as with the spruce beetle, <coughs> the, the question was, you know, we're seeing aphids on other plants. Yeah, are they spruce aphids or not? And you know, if the population continues to build a few more warm winters, you know, you you see insects do odd things when they start running out of food, right? And so it might not be foreseeable, unforeseeable to see them, you know, hosting on a plant or to start to, you know, maybe now they found that green growth not very tolerable because they don't have to eat it, but uh, maybe in a year or two if this persists, they might be more, you know, have to become or a certain number of them more tolerant than eating that new green growth. So you know, the key thing is is, I guess, discussing what you're seeing, because it's, it may not be unusual depending, you know, what the population is doing, and you might see them on other hosts. Okay. 
Since I heard the terminology spiking a tree, is that the same thing <coughs> as injecting the tree? Um, yeah, it could be. There, there, there was uh, a treatment method called ACE caps that was on the market. It's not on the market anymore, and that actually involved drilling into your tree and <coughs> putting in these little pesticide spikes that get up, that get uh, taken up by your translocated by your tree's vascular system. And those aren't on the market anymore, so that that may just be that kind of remnant terminology. Um, but has this kind of outbreak ever happened before here? Not here, not in, uh, not in South Central. So here's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can see it pretty clearly, right? Far coastal, you know, coastal, yeah. and now, you know, kind of here we are. So um, not, not that we know of. How does that okay, sound? Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, there's obviously they're not not the good document. How long does the, when you drench the soil, how long does that pesticide stay in the tree? Um, from the, maybe some folks in the audience who have tried the soil drenching technique, but my understanding is about the same time, you know, about a year or so as well. You know, <coughs> on that soil drenching, in the directions, because I don't read real well, <laughs> sure. it's a little bit vague. Okay. And I called up, you had on here the extension soil. Yeah, you yeah. it. Yeah. All that is supposed to be one ounce. <clears throat> You're supposed to take a gallon of water, one ounce of the solution for every inch in the diameter going around the tree. Okay. Just measure that about four feet up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what when I called up and asked them, they had said to mix it one ounce to a gallon of water, spread it, and keep doing it that way. So you'd actually be putting twenty four gallons of water. And that is apparently is not correct. Because I called them today. Oh, okay. If, <clears throat> like on that tree, if it was 24 inches in circumference, would be, she said you could use two gallons on a larger tree, but you're actually taking a gallon of water and adding an ounce into that gallon of water for every inch okay. of water. Okay. Good to know. Very okay. good. So my first attempt at it was a waste. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I, mean, I think it was. But anyway, the second way, uh, doing one ounce. 20 ounce or whatever to one gallon of water will certainly make it go a lot faster. Okay, very good to know. Thank you. I wonder can, do you want to, can you stand up and just say what you just said? Because <laughs> I don't think people back here kind of heard and I think what you were just saying about the your formula that you learned was a good one. Um, just had to put you on the spot. But. Okay. Yeah, here it is right here, second page. Mm -hmm. So this uh, Monterey solution, where I got it was in wagon wheel, and I, I think they still have it. They, they have run out. Anyway, it comes to a gallon, and <clears throat> it's a little bit vaguer. It was for me, is you take one ounce of this solution and mix it in one gallon of water. Before you do that, to find out how much you're going to use to grant around the tree. You measure the outside circumference of the tree and about four feet on right it, it, it isn't real complicated but about waist height just take a ruler and go around the outside of the tree and it's for, in this example it was 24 inches so I'm going to use 24 ounces of solution and when I called up the UAF they said use one ounce per gallon and continue with that so it'd actually be 24 ounces but it'd actually be 24 gallons that I'd be spreading, and that is not correct. It is, you take one gallon of water, you measure your tree, if it's 24 inches or a can, if it's 24 inches, you use 24 ounces of the solution in one gallon of water. That doesn't seem correct, but I, I called back to the company this morning and that was, I talked to for quite a while. But if your tree is bigger than 50 inches, then, then you have to use a second gallon for anything over 50 inches. So you can use one inches. gallon and one ounce up to 50 ounces. And then so like I had a 100 inch tree, so it was two gallons of water with 50, 50 ounces each in each gallon. And that's, she said that. She okay. said on larger trees, 
you can use two gallons of water and then your, your 50 ounces is just by capacity. The only reason I brought that up is because I went through three gallons of that stuff and it's 50 bucks a gallon. And it was the wrong way of doing it. So That's why I thought it would be good for everybody to hear. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's a way, either you could call Wagon Wheel or Hans, if there's a way to buy it in bulk so that people could buy instead of buying it was probably not there be because he ran out or he's been Yeah, no, out. that's what I heard from a lot of people. We have, we have two kinds of uh, drenching uh, stuff at our store right now, and it's coming in small containers. Right. But um, I'll call a company and see if I can get some bigger. Yeah. What kind right. of So that people could go in together or make it a little more affordable yeah. so that people could. But, but what did the directions say on, on the container? I mean, did you follow the directions? Yeah, it's just to like a regular a bucket or a watering can, just a plastic watering can. But for the ratio, the, the directions on the thing, the ratio of how many ounces to how much water? <clears throat> if you take, you start out with the average tree, he set up to 50, 50 inches around. What I was talking about, my trees are <clears throat> about 25 inches around, which makes them about 20 feet tall, maybe taller. So just very simply, <clears throat> measure around it's 20 inches in one gallon of water. You're taking 20 ounces and mixing it into that. And just like a watering can, you put it in, mix it up real well, and then just drench right around the truck. And then it says to go over it with water again so it soaks in. We have granules at the store, and we also have a liquid. And uh, we just mix the liquid. We do a lot of our trees already, but we also have granules that you just spread around the tree and you add water to that. You water them in. What just take is, is that from this manufacturer? Because I looked in there and I didn't see it. No, it should have. Uh, we put up, I put up a sign back that has one of these. You know, it has one of these here. Uh, one of these right on it. I also put it in the paper too and put it on sales. But you said it's, it goes down to granules? Uh, well, yeah. I'm just not sure how much I have left now. Didn't have that much of an interest. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, just before I forget here, I'll, I'll provide my uh, contact information. So, uh, my phone number is two six zero forty two hundred. Two six zero forty two hundred. My name is Hans Rinky. And yeah, so uh, if, we, if we forget here, uh, most likely if I forget. Uh, so go ahead, there. Hans, if it's already ground, the pesticide going to help the ground with needles that are already dead? No, it won't. The needles that are dead are, will stay dead. It will just. So is it going to have a donut look? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it'll, it will be thin on the inside, right? Your tree will be thin on the inside. We'll have uh, those, you know, and, and uh, the idea would be those branches will continue to grow from the outside, right? So there will, it will be a thinner looking tree on the inside of the tree. Yeah, exactly. The climate tree. Uh, I think they get the weather there maybe a little less frequently, so they have the returns a little more frequently. You know, in Southeast, you kind of saw that map. That, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, it's obviously frequenting Southeast more. Same with British Columbia, I would guess that it's, um, you know, more uh, more reoccurring more often, you know. With yeah, so we would, if we got a cold winter, then, and then had a warm winter again, we'd have eight of the jams. Yeah, I think it probably depends, tough question to answer, but, the, you know, if we get a, if we get a I mean, uh, I don't know enough to know if we could proceed a spruce ape is leaving and not returning, right? You know, conceivably a series of normal winters might really slow the growth. You know, we, we kind of saw this, in 2015, but uh, my wife would be the first person to tell you that I a lot of times don't see things. So, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that I haven't been going on, right? You know, in some 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 spot somewhere on a few properties, you know, with a few trees thing before anyone really, you know, noticed. So, but the last few years certainly coincide with the warm winters we've had, right? It, you know, it kind of makes sense. So, I would venture to guess that it's probably. Uh, 
that's probably it'll probably return. You know, if it if, if it leaves due to cold winters, it will maybe either have some remnant population or you know it arrived here for some reason. You know, maybe or venture to guess someone before. someone transplanted a tree here that had it from a different location. You know, so that will probably happen again. I know you mentioned earlier about the other kind of spruce that were affected. You bet. And I didn't hear you. Did you say the blue spruce and other ornamentals could also yeah. be affected? Yeah. Blue and Norway spruce in Alaska. Like yeah. the, none of the none of the literature says that uh, white spruce is a host, but uh, mainly it would be blue. Norway here in Alaska. Other parts of the U.S. You know, obviously Sitka, right? One we have here. So. Um, Engelman spruce in the lower 48, northern Rockies, central Rockies. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. I can't vouch for it, but there was an article in the paper, if I remember correctly, that said to really knock this back, we needed um, 10 days in a row of 15 sure. or lower. Yeah. We needed that longer period that, that, that cold can really yeah. penetrate. Uh, that sounds like consistent with Pray for cold. Well. I think the handout that we have, you know, the attention service put together for sort of says 15 degrees, doesn't say the duration, but that sounds, sounds good to me. I can oh, go ahead. One more thing, just back to the animals. Um, so you're saying birds appear not to be affected. Um, squirrels, uh, the, do they have to eat the aphid to be infected by the pesticide, or do they have to be eating the needles to be infected by the pesticide? What's the... Thing there, or just, just the presence of like the squirrel you know, like on the, the tree. You know, like these little chickadee birds, I think what they're called. Okay. You go down on your, your trees and watch them. They eat those aphids, and they're not bothering them as far as I can see. I mean, you can see them up and down, but they're going on the needles, and they're, they're eating the aphids. You're going to have to have about 30 million of them to do any good, but they, they do eat them, and I haven't seen any <laughs> birds affected by them. Okay, so right. even eating the aphid that's got this pesticide in it is, does not appear to be an issue. But the pesticide yeah. makes the aphid not eat the tree. No, no, I understand. So there'd be nothing wrong with the aphid for the chickadee to eat. Yeah. So, well, so the ornithologist in me, I've been observing um, the bird behavior this summer, at least, from trees that have just the green needle tips. And the birds are using. Stand up, Betsy. What? Can you stand up? Because people can't <laughs> hear you in the back. I know, I'm sorry. So the ornithologist in me is, I've been observing birds, and this is just anecdotal, it's not scientific, but the birds are using these near dead trees with the green tips as sun perches, nesting sites, feeding areas, and also hides. And so the tree is still serving a purpose, even though it's, the interior is dead, but the green needle tips are still there. So the birds are thriving in these trees. It's probably less of a hide, but not so for the other uses. But they're not ingesting anything. They're, in, they're uh, you know, I haven't, I assume they're eating yeah, the needles. aphids, but there's such a small toxic load for each aphid that I think, you know, just their, their small diet is not, I, I don't know, this is not scientific, but I've got tons of birds in my conifer trees that are, you know, just have the green needle tips. And I haven't really seen a change in the bird behavior or use of them. And you injected, right? You did some. I injection? injected one tree next okay. to my house that is a favored bird perch, song perch, mm -hmm. for all species. And so mm -hmm. I want to save that tree. Yeah, and the injection work. Well, I just had it injected a couple of weeks ago, so I'll find out next sure. spring. Yeah, it seems like um, the the way to get more answers about that would be to see if people have been doing research studies down in the um, Canada or the lower 48, you know, where they've been doing blood testing on birds or that kind of thing, or reproductive success, you know, maybe some of the universities down in that area. Right. And I, 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 I don't know if, if there's a listserv or something, if people find that information, maybe they could share it, because, you know, it's probably, like, difficult to find, but maybe out there. And be nice to have that. Maybe if we sent it to Coastal Studies. You can send it to us and we can put it on our, yeah, we can send it out and we can put it on our Facebook and also the Catch My Pay Nature Watch um, Facebook page too and send it out by email. <laughs> so I have a, a, on a lighter note, an entomology question. You was about this parthenogenesis stuff, and so it's just the women making the babies, but some of them are, are guys. 
So what's the evolutionary purpose of these guys? Pretty much the same as ours. Uh, 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 pretty much the same as ours. <laughs> I can ask the next question. Just yeah. take your yeah. space. Here's my answer to that question. Good this dress. is a, uh, <laughs> this from British Columbia, right? This is from uh, British Columbia Research, the province of British Columbia, and this is on the life history. Um, and I, I may have misspoke here about the any males. It says, uh, North, America, North American populations of green spruce acorn are usually female only. Some males have been found in Arizona populations. No sexual reproduction occurs. Females can be wingless or wing, and uh, the wingless predominate throughout the year. So males are very, very rare. Yeah, I've got a, a wife and two daughters, so I get this all the time. I guess the question is, where do I get the Y chromosome? <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll stick around if there's any more questions. Stick around for as long as you want. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you.